I'm Shantanu and I'm an architect at Flipkart and um, there basically architects get to do a lot of different kind of things. So one of the things that I do is take care of a few of the analytics uh, sections uh, at play. Uh, so most of the things that I work on are uh, faced towards the developers, okay, versus metrics and data for business. So Hyperion is primarily a system which is used mostly by developers and ops and CS, etc. There is one more system which is called Bigfoot and that is used for business level analytics. So mostly I'll concentrate on this guy today. So what is it? It's basically an event processing system which is used by dev teams. Okay, to get insights into what's happening in a deployed system or on apps. It's used by uh, on-call for debugging uh, customer service issues uh, for some cases, especially issues arising on apps or on the web, uh, not the main website, but uh, we have a web reader which is used to read ebooks on the website, so any kind of issues, which is actually pretty JavaScript heavy. So it has to work on a lot of different kind of platforms, like a couple of days back we got one guy who was using Firefox 3 on Windows NT. Okay, so debugging those kind of issues is very difficult because we don't even have all of those items uh, locally, all of those uh, environments locally. So, and it's used by business teams for certain use cases. So we'll look at a few of the use cases. So this is one of the screens, it's like showing. Uh, so we have a uh, in-house uh, storage system which we built. It's a distributed file system and this guy is showing uh, events that are happening on that and like 24 hours and resource get is the highest number of events from this particular application. So this is basically our monitoring screen and we have a trend graph also like over a month, how many of different kind of events happened from a particular system. And there is also search and a few other functionality. So why did we need uh, this thing? So this guy actually came up from our uh, digital team which I was a part of uh, uh, for some time, I recently moved to a different team. So um, uh, there we were actually developing apps to read ebooks on different platforms, Windows, iOS, Android, web, okay. And we were also building the backend infrastructure to support those apps, okay. For example, download systems, right, like some download system which serve out samples, they are cached, some which actually send out the books, they are obviously not cached, they are DRM, et etc. et cetera, right. So they actually go, so we needed to monitor all of those systems, right, and we needed to know like how many people are reading books, how many books were downloaded, okay, and if the app crashed, what was the state of the system before the app crashed, uh, or the app before the app crashed, okay. And CS issues, like somebody comes and says, okay, I'm not able to download the book, I already paid for it, okay, what, what, what are we supposed to do now? So, that, right, JavaScript errors, I mentioned, it's like a big problem to debug remotely, especially you don't expect your customers to be a lot savvy about like what is happening on their index db inside the browser etc etc right so yeah mm. <coughs> besides that <coughs> there are a few small uh, business use cases like uh, we have ebooks which we get from multiple suppliers say penguin or random house etc so they upload the book right after they upload they come back and ask okay i uploaded this book what happened to it okay I need to know what happened to the book, it was supposed to go live, why didn't it go live, right? And uh, besides that we have, uh, this guy is now also integrated with our uh, retail app, so retail app is, it has about, I don't know, about a couple of million installs I think, okay. And uh, so we send out some marketing notifications, etc, etc. So it's about, when was this notification sent? Why was this sent? It, it came from which downstream system, etc, etc. So these are like some of the major use cases for Hyperion. 
and there are also other use cases which we as developers use like uh, if I push some new code and there are certain metrics I want to see if that some section of the code is actually getting it right if there are errors what kind of errors are happening and I want to be alerted uh, in those situations right so all of these kind of requirements came up so at that time we were starting off with our uh, some uh, some internship program so we started this guy up as one of the things that uh, in as one of the projects okay so, and we came up with a sort of expensive problem statement list it was like uh, so first requirement was uh, everybody that wanted to use this gave us the primary condition okay we'll send data but we you should not slow us down right so that was the primary uh, this thing because the somebody click download it should immediately start downloading it you cannot uh, slow down downloads because you want to persist some of the download information somewhere in your system right and um, we have a lot of different kind of uh, technologies that use okay so some people some guy will use Kala others will use Ruby others will use Java somebody will use Python so this guy needs to work with all of that at least the event push part onboarding should be simple and there are many teams and if it's complicated to push an event nobody is going to use it and like so that's not something that you'd want mm, and uh, there are also some basic guarantees that you need to give if you are planning to build this kind of a system the minimal part of that is that uh, once an event once you accept an event you cannot say that you have not been able to persist the event due to some reason okay that's a guarantee that you have to give that if you accept an event you have to push it out okay how well a database is written there is only one truth about it is that it will go down for some reason or the other okay so that's reality of life okay if anything else a couple of your boxes will go down in your cluster you cannot stop that from happening okay so uh, the system that you are writing should be resilient to that resilient to that in the sense that you can have a slowdown in the message that's coming say if your processing latency was 20 milliseconds it can go up to say 100 milliseconds but the system should not go down and even if it goes down you can still take messages and basically when you are back up you should be able to process that very very fast and get up to speed okay and uh, if you have certain critical functionality based on your event stream you should plan in such a way that even in case your database or something goes down you should still be able to not like uh, able to support those critical use cases for example alerts okay let's say if you have a critical alert on say for example your checkout one of your machines which is doing user checkouts being down it cannot that particular event cannot get blocked because you are not able to persist to the database okay some more <coughs> so uh, there is a lot of uh, different kind of analytics that you can do on your event stream but um, we decided to go with a small and mostly used subset okay which was querying so you can query an event based on the fields that you are sending or sending through it second is grouping like group by different component a group by a publisher and a book and the different components that it went through okay so group by count right and trends right and uh, of course histograms that i showed you like histograms are important because they give you a visual representation of the state of your system right if it's zero you know something has gone wrong you don't even need alerts for that so visual representation is very very important most of our uh, people most of the people who wanted to on onboard hypergen they said okay we'll make our own consoles we don't want generic this thing we know what fields we'll query on we know what graphs etc we want so we'll make our own console so we had to have a set of apis that simple apis that those guys could use right and uh, back end so uh, the data model that we are uh, storing 
um, we knew upfront that the, all the different kind of use cases that people are going to do on this guy, probably we won't be able to code it up as a platform team. Okay, so individual teams will probably write their own custom analytics. So the storage system need, needed to be somewhat uh, friendly to that. So this is the base architecture that we came up with. So these are the guys who will push events and there will be an API which uh, like this guy is just a API to ingest events. Okay, it takes single events and it will take batch events. It has no other function. Okay, so from there we had to put it in some messaging system which will work as our uh, which will work as our st uh, staging area, right? So from there we'll use some kind of a stream processor and put it to two different stores. Okay, one is the short term query store which will be used for the base functionality that I said, graphs, uh, like histograms, queries, like simple search queries and groups and trends, right. And there would be a um, long term store where, which, uh, which people will run their own custom jobs on, okay. And the query store will expose API on the query store and people can write their consoles on top of that or they can pull data from the backend store and uh, into their own storage and create their own APIs. <coughs> so with that, uh, we started our design, uh, this thing. And now, uh, so basic architecture was fixed. Now we had to fix the tech stack, right? So first was the messaging system, what to choose. So here, um, we wanted replication we wanted parallel read capabilities and we wanted the system to be resilient to downstream failures. That means that if you are uh, reading once from the database and so uh, if you are reading once from the queue and you are trying to write to something, if it fails, I can come back again to write, uh, uh, again to read from it, okay. First, second is this is valuable data. So others might want to write other syst some other system which will use the same data stream. Right? So that guy should also get the same functionality. Okay. So there um, we chose Apache Kafka at the time. Okay. So the problem with uh, this was uh, when we started off with this, the stable version of Kafka was 0 0.7. Okay which did not have replication per se, at least not inside the system. But that is something that we needed because of the base guarantee, right? That if we take and acknowledge a message, we cannot go back and say that we could not persist it. So we wanted replication on the queue, which was not present there. So we decided to go ahead with uh, Kafka 0 0.8, which was beta 1 at that point of time. Okay. Uh, so the good thing is, yeah, it's open source. It's um, extremely fast. It's very, very fast. So the base uh, philosophy of Kafka is that uh, if you are writing sequentially to a particular file or you are reading sequentially to a particular file, uh, from a particular file, your reads and writes are almost as fast as, fast as reading from a uh, traditional memory. Okay. So since our use cases mapped very much with that and we were never planning to do any kind of random seeks other than in failure scenarios, we decided to go with this. Okay. So now if you are starting off with something like this, I had uh, urge you to take a look at a project called Luxun, L-U-X-U-N. Okay. I have not used it, but it looked pretty promising. I've used their other projects. It's the source is available on GitHub. You can take a look. I think it's from a Chinese company. Anyways, so yeah, as I said, it was beta and uh, the other part of Kafka is the server has practically no control. So if you have guys have used something like Trabidem queue, etc., where you actually attach a queue to a uh, consumer to the queue and the server will send you messages. Okay, here it's a little bit different. You have to specify which offset you are going to read from. Okay, so every queue or topic as it is called in Kafka is broken up into partitions. 
you use a single thread to read from a particular partition and you specify an offset. So you say, okay, uh, from this partition, I'll start reading from uh, partition uh, offset 20, say. And it has metadata calls that you can make to the server to get what are the valid start and end offsets on the system, okay. So one of the major uh, things that you have to do if you are working with Kafka is to figure out how to store your offsets. So Kafka has two sets of consumers, which is one is called a high level consumer. Another is actually the low level consumer. So if you, if you are using the high level consumer, um, it has no ACK kind of mechanism, okay. So if you ask for a message, it will write the offset to zookeeper and then give you the message, okay. What we wanted to use was the low level consumer where you have absolute control. You can read from any particular offset, but in that case you have to maintain your own offset. So ingestion API, uh, because of the multi-platform thing, we did not want to go with anything fancy and we actually wanted to see how much latency this guy was ad uh, adding. At the same time, we decided that we'll go with the fastest available framework. Um, so we decided to go with REST Express, which was, which we saw after evaluating a couple of them, which like Drop Wizard and REST Express and few others, we found that this was the fastest guy. Uh, okay, for, uh, honestly speaking, we could have tried out Spray at that time, which we did not because, uh, uh, but yeah, this guy is pretty damn fast actually. So, and it's also very lightweight, okay. And as I said, in our API server, we uh, in our ingestion API, we basically wanted to do almost nothing other than just writing to the queue. So storage, as I said, it was broken up in two parts. So the query store, where you keep uh, stuff indexed and uh, your data will get TTL'd out, okay. So in query store, we you don't actually store all your data. You store a relevant amount of data and for a certain time, like that depended on the team and when somebody wants to onboard this guy, we ask him like, how much queryable data do you want? Say some guy will say one month, others will say two months. Some other guy will say, okay, I can do with one week, etc., etc. Right? So we work with that, and uh, the long-term store where we keep all data. Okay. So, and that is also our golden source. In case our query store goes down, we have uh, scripts and uh, code ready to pull data from the golden store back into the query store. So at the time when we started, basically what we decided to go with was uh, the short term store was going to be MongoDB and long term store was going to be HBase. Uh, in the long term store, basically we wanted no features. It was just a key value dump for us. And we have a centralized cluster across Flipkart. Like we have two, three clusters. So we decided to go with the uh, fast write cluster that has op support and all of that. So we decided to go with HBase for that. But we could have gone with any other storage for the backend which works well with key values, right? And uh, the query part, we went with MongoDB, not an, un, uh, not, I don't know like how many people would do that if you're talking about a real time system, but we did some tests and it was, it, it's actually pretty good, okay, uh, talking from speed. And why we went with this was it has a good set of functions that you can actually use. For example, aggregates and groups, right, and trends. And in aggregates, basically, you can create pipelines of different things. For example, in which you can do fairly complicated. So a few days back, I wrote a eight-segment pipeline, which can actually create a funnel of all the events across the a particular app. Okay, this many people started reading, this many people of that finished, etc, etc, right. So it comes with its own quirks, of course, like every database. But uh, we saw that most of our use cases were getting supported uh, with this, right. And it was, it's pretty easy enough to maintain, okay. And the storage architecture that we use for MongoDB is, uh, basically we have shards. So we are, um, 
we were till now do using only one shard. So basically, we had three machines, and it's critical. Okay, so three machines is something that we felt was the optimal size to use a shard. Okay, so <coughs> you need one master and two replicas for that. Okay, in in a, in a particular uh, replica set, you need three machines. So one of them will go down, or um, you might have to take one node down voluntarily for certain things. For example. What MongoDB does is it will not uh, it will not release space. Okay, so let's say you have an app which was pushing a lot of events due to some spike for some time, which took about 100 gigs of data, right? And that guy got TTL'd away, right? That spike, all the data got <coughs> TTL'd away, but that place is not released. Okay, so after some time. What will happen if you have not uh, taken this into account, you might have to take one node down, delete its data and rebuild it from the other nodes, which is fast, but it is, you cannot live with that kind of latency, okay, because our architecture is such that our queries never hit the primary, okay, they always hit the secondary and primaries are uh, only for writes, okay. So, these are certain things that uh, we knew and some of them we learnt along the way while we were using Mongo, like it's pretty good. We are currently in the process of moving away from it, but I'll discuss the reasons later on. So processing pipeline, uh, we wanted something that was good with retries and it was Storm without a question. Okay, so Storm, there is a seminal talk by Nathan Mars, who is actually the creator of Storm, <coughs> where he describes the philosophy behind Storm. Okay, and the base philosophy is that your systems will go down. Okay, even Storm itself will go down. Storm has supervisors and Nimbus, which is basically the central server. All of them will go down. Your GUI client will go down for Storm. Okay. But the thing is, your everything should be come back, should be able to recover once uh, the other dependent components are up. Okay, so Storm is basically built on the philosophy of being very fast, obviously, and secondly, recoverability. Okay, so we were using Storm. Uh, we decided to use Storm. Obviously, at that point of time, Kafka was uh, so one of the most complicated pieces that you might ever want, have to write on Storm is basically the spout. So, spout on a Storm topology, which is basically a computing, uh, basically a representation of the computation that you want to execute on a Storm cluster, um, is called a topology. So, inside a topology, you have something called as a spout. Spout is the guy who actually reads data into the cluster. Okay, and bolts are guys who actually process the um, process the data, right? And there are committers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can go through the Storm documentation to understand all of that. But the writing a spout is fairly complicated stuff. Okay, and the pro uh, good part about Storm is there is a good community of people who keep writing spouts for different kind of uh, data sources. You have spouts for HBase, you have Kafka, you have RabbitMQ and lot of different kind of spouts, interesting ones, Twitter Firehose, etc, etc. So, when we started, obviously there was no spout for Kafka point eight, and Kafka point eight, the protocol is actually fairly different from 0 0.7, like 60, 70 percent different. Okay, so there was no question of being able to reuse a lot of the code that they were doing, but still we decided to go ahead with it, right. So now with, so basically the major parts we have covered, we have the queue system which we decided to be Kafka which was going to act as our, uh, which was going to act as our staging area, right. Then uh, the processing part which was, which we decided to be Storm and two data segments, one was the query store which was going to be MongoDB and the long term store which was HBase, right. Now what, what, what do we do actually in the Storm? cluster. So, we decided to go with HBase as the offset store. Why? Because we knew exactly what we are going to write. So, it was never going to, uh, 
it exactly what we were going to write as well as to read so it was never going to be a scan it was always going to be a get or a put which is extremely fast on edge base okay so offset decided was going to be in edge base right and uh, mongodb we did not want to hit mongodb for frequently used queries so um, for example histograms so if you open the hyperion console the first thing that comes up is your histograms and if you visit flipkart you see many people who have using uh, hyperion have actually that console open on one of their screens or on some monitor etc right so that is quite a quite a bit of queries which did not want to put mongodb through that so basically what we decided was to do certain kind of pre computations at least for the matrix part right like how many events are coming in etc okay um <clears throat> other thing was we did not want to expose all of the functionality given by mongodb because of several reasons first is not every database is optimized to do everything okay secondly we wanted to keep our options open when we were talking about the query store so that's why we wanted to expose only a few functionality even on search say for example you are searching on an integer field we wanted to give you all the normal operators like uh, less than greater than greater than equal to etc etc but some not something like um, say for example module actually that's a bad uh, uh, bad example so string search we are probably going to give you equals not equals etc but we were not very keen on giving you contents because mongodb is not very good at doing contents queries even on indexed fields okay they have done certain improvements in that field but at that point of time that was not an option so what we wanted to do was in the cluster while we were processing the events we wanted to do certain amount of uh, metadata analysis on the events that came in so once we get an event and that has different kind of fields and we wanted to see which field was integer which field was flow testing etc blah blah and store all that metadata information somewhere right when you are querying from the front end and even from the apis you could hit a api to get the metadata for a particular event or event set and use those but operations only to query other things will raise an exception and if you are doing it from the console they won't even be visible uh so uh, our failure uh, recovery is pretty simple in storm either we write to both or we fail okay if there is an outage on say edge base or mongodb it will fail it will retry later on. there is no asynchronous write okay we uh, in the bolt so bolt uh, basically a topology is uh, arranged like a series of operations think of it as write to edge base write to mongodb and then commit the offsets to edge base right if any of these three fail the event will get processed again okay uh, one more thing that was important was uh, since this was going to hold a fairly large amount of data we wanted to divide the query space okay so dividing the query space was simple enough we decided to uh, come up with the concept of apps okay so an app is basically a logical separation so for example ebooks ebook reader is an app that uh, and ebook uh, delivery is an app okay like that so it's like a logical separation of um, the whole event space so what does an event look like so event looks like this we have a mandatory header part where you give a few things like app event type is for the user only like reader crashed book downloaded book download error book download rejected due to ip conflict etc etc right so this is something that makes logical sense to you platform is since this was uh, um, one of the major use cases was to be able to use it with apps platform is a component in the header itself where you say it's like android or ios etc etc and when we have timestamp instance is some id to identify where this guy is coming from uh, for example if this is coming from a particular 
machine, not a app, not a handle device, this might contain the IP address of the machine. And event ID is just an ID for the event. You can just generate and put uh, some UID or some other string that you want. So the key for an event of our system is actually a hash of all of these fields. And all of these fields are mandatory. Okay. The interesting part is actually the data. So in data, you can basically send any type of field, any valid JSON object. So once you send it, you can also have nested JSON, etc., etc., and through our metadata analysis, we come up with a list of fields that you have created, and what are the different types for that. As I said, we have APIs from which you can actually retrieve that data. Uh, so, for Hyperion, actually, instead of one, we have two topologies. Okay, so the first topology I described fairly in depth like what we do. We do metadata analysis, we write to both stores, we commit the offsets and then return. The other guy actually writes to a secondary Kafka cluster. Okay, and we have a small library which uh, has a sort of a predicate system, uh, predicate language which you can use to read a subset of events, right. So this helps other guys to build um, systems say a uh, alerting system, you want you push some new code, you just want to see, monitor it for a day to see if there are certain sections of the code that are failing. So you hook into the secondary cluster with that subscription system and you pull events from that and only error events from that. So you write a small amount of code which will send you a mail if that kind of event comes. So those kinds of use cases and as you see these are use cases, mostly these will be cases which cannot fail due to a data store failure. So, um, this guy is written to by a separate topology, okay. So, the status currently is, uh, it takes around 35, 40 million events a day. We have a three node Kafka cluster, two worker nodes on Storm, three MongoDB node cluster, around 900 gigs of data on the cluster and uh, about five, six terabytes of data on HBS. We are doing a fairly large amount of upscaling on this, so all of this will at least double the events will actually go up like five, six times. So Kafka is becoming a seven node cluster and workers are like two, two, uh, four to eight. MongoDB is increasing to six, seven and this guy, the query data will go to three terabytes, edge base will also go up accordingly. At certain things we found out while doing it is that in the ingestion API, basically don't do anything, okay. Basic amount of checks which let you keep the system functional, just do that. For example, if you are dependent on the field of your headers, just make sure that all the requisite fields are present and just push, okay. Don't do anything else. <coughs> Batching is mostly a no-brainer, but this actually made a fairly different, uh, fairly good performance impact. For example, if you are writing to Kafka, writing a single event and a reasonable size batch takes almost the same time, okay. So in the Kafka protocol itself, they have support for batching where they compress multiple events into one, one particular message and then forward. So that speeds up writing very, very fast. Similarly, MongoDB writes are fast. HBase, if you are doing a put list instead of a put, where you put like 20, 30 events uh, at the same time, it will get very, very fast. Oh, one more caveat about Mongo is you should not call update on anything a lot. Okay. If you call update, it will become a problem. If you use it, as long as it use it as some kind of append only store, is very good. Okay, one more thing about Mongo, which we are not using, but in case you plan to use it, is that if you are uh, writing to Mongo, Try to uh, get the object ID as the ID for the document, okay. That's very fast. So Mongo has a system where it can generate an ID for your document. That key is, uh, well, uh, the key generation actually is very fast, okay. And it contains certain other information also which you can leverage. But that was not an option for us due to various reasons. Another thing is, if you are planning to use Storm, it has a nifty feature which is not very well documented, where, uh, where actually your processing units get a context object, 
where you can save your connections and other frequently used things. So once it spawn on a cluster node, that guy actually lives, okay. It does not die for every batch. So that code is persistent. So if you save something in your topology object, uh, in your topology context, you can retrieve that. It is like a map, okay. So you just save it with a map and object and typecast and use it later on. So it is actually very fast, very fast in the sense our processing for an event came down from 2000 millisecond to 45 milliseconds right after we started using contexts, okay. Even when we were batching inside this guy, right. So yeah, so that is some thing. One important part is uh, basically how uh, to set up your expectations about what you are going to do, right. And the major part that I try to explain to everybody is that the system will only facilitate getting and seeing your data. If you are putting garbage into it, it is completely useless. So the point is uh, to get a good balance, okay. You should put enough data that lets you analyze systems, but not so much that you are actually, for example, do not send a 1 MB message. Okay, there is, I can think of almost no event level data that can have 1 MB of context, okay. Anyways, that might happen in some case, but my point is that um, what I uh, ask everybody when they are planning to onboard Hyperion or any other this kind of system is do you know what you are going to push. So coming up with your schema of events is very important, okay before you are writing some this kind of a system. Uh, analytics what you are going to build on uh, the, uh, what you are going to build on the real time set should be minimal and that should of course follow uh, like cover whatever you want to do with the data but it should be minimal, um, it should be the minimal set. Like any other fancy stuff that you want to build on top of it, you can do it offline. You can have a pseudo real time kind of thing where you are processing a delta of the data in the back end, right, from your permanent data store uh, using some table scan or some uh, timestamp based scan, right, and keep generating that data and store it in a cache and when people ask, just send it out from the cache, right. Uh, do not put too much unnecessary uh, analytics pressure on the query store. If you keep it simple as was said in the last presentation, okay, your focus should be on simplicity. If all like so comes razor, basically of all things that you can do always go for the simplest thing, especially if you are looking for speed, that should be your primary focus, speed, speed and nothing else, right. And you have to consider scalability as an integral part of your system. So every component that you choose for this kind of a system, you should consider scalability as a primary requirement, okay. Kafka, add a few nodes, you can add partitions, it will get uh, balanced. So some balancing will happen and you can distribute the load, right. Same for MongoDB, you can add one more shard and it should be okay, right. And <coughs> same for edge base, of course, I mean, so scalability should be an integral part of your system. So besides Hyperion, we have a lot of other things, a uh, couple of other systems that we are working on, okay. One which I am actually very proud of is uh, what we call as a precog, as the precog system, okay. So this actually started up as a hack dev project. Uh, as a hack the project and so what this guy does is um, it creates a computational cluster. So there is a Debian package, you install it somewhere, it becomes a part of the cl execution cluster. It has a server component. So what and what we can do is basically write small primitives that take a message, do something and then release the message. Okay, or not release the message, at which point of time the message execution stops. So what you can do is, so a problem with Storm is uh, the deployment of a computation is actually some sort of a code deployment, okay. So 
it's not like you can do it from the console. It's not like that. Okay, it's code deployment actually. Uh, this guy, what you can do is it gives you a tool, sort of a toolbox. Okay, and like Storm, it has a source. You can take a source, attach a few computations to it, and just deploy it. Click, click, click. Write a JSON to create your computation and deploy. Okay, on your cluster, and you have control like uh, on how many nodes this is going to execute, etc., etc. Right. So we are working on this. Hopefully, this will get open sourced some part of time. Um, so that's one system. Other part is actually let me come back to the data storage. So the problem with MongoDB is, and I think you must have understood by now, indexing is a huge problem in databases. Okay, like you can have indexes for your computations, but with time, as the number of uh, indexes increase it will start to affect okay <laughs> problem with hyperion now is it's fairly popular so a lot of teams want to use it they want to create indexes and we don't have a lot of control so sometimes from the console they'll fire queries on fields that are not indexed okay which will affect everything across the cluster uh, so so we wanted to have something which is built on indexing okay and we knew knew about that at that point of time also. That was Elasticsearch. Okay, the problem that Elasticsearch had that point of time was there was only one type of uh, thing uh, that you could do on it from an analytics point of view, which was aggregation, uh, which was basically faceting. So now in the new version, they have come up with a uh, with the aggregations framework, which is actually quite powerful. Okay. I urge you to take a look at that. It's actually very, very powerful. So what we are doing is we are writing a data access layer. You can call it a data access layer, which looks like a database where the data files are actually, uh, data files is actually edge based and the indexing is actually elastic set. Okay. So you query data on elastic search and you get it back from uh, the data, actual data comes from the edge based cluster. So we are working on that. That's called Foxtrot again that that might be open source fairly soon. Okay, it will go into production soon. Mm. Uh, the other precog right now is being used as a log aggregation system by multiple teams. It does more than a hundred million events every day. So these are the resources of custom, REST Express, MongoDB and HBS. Questions? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, actually we did take a look. So, um, for us distribution and replica were two primary, uh, yeah, so uh, what he's asking is basically did we look at other kind of queuing systems when we were looking for, uh, when we decided to go with Kafka. So, the point is uh, actually we did and at that point of time with our use cases that was mostly the only guy which was fairly stable and matching. But as I said, that looks on project, it looks promising. So uh, probably you should, anybody who is planning to do it now should probably take a look at that. Yes. Spout. It's also written by Nathan Mars. Yeah, so the question is, uh, did we consider using Kestrel while we were going, while we were using, uh, while we decided to use Storm? Um, Kestrel, yes, we considered, but even Kestrel was not so stable at that point of time. And uh, some of our other teams were using Kafka and they had only good things to say about it. Uh, so we decided to go with Kafka. Uh, we wrote the spout, uh, but in case uh, you want to know, now Kafka 8 is stable and there is an official spout for Kafka 8 that you can use ready-made in Storm. Uh, 
because the long term storage we were um, one of uh, so the question was why did we not go with mongodb as our long term storage so the point is uh, for long term storage we were expecting a large amount of long running jobs on this guy and to be hit uh, way more than how the query stories it like scans the number of scans would be high so um, most of the teams are comfortable using hadoop for that okay so pulling the data using scoop etc didn't make a sense a lot of sense and so we decided to go with this guy uh, actually it amounts to 150 if you look at it uh, it yeah it contains index and secondly the data is not evenly balanced some guys have more data than others so yeah yeah so uh multi dc yeah so we are it's not yet multi dc we are planning to do multi dc which should be fairly simple uh, if you are planning to do multi dc with this you should take a look at uh, so kafka has a component that is used exactly for this purpose you can copy from one system to another across data centers okay yeah so yeah you should not um, at least the way i have seen when connections go uh, i think it's a bad idea to write directly to database from one system to another one dc to another it should be content you should transport the data from one system to the other yeah uh, from the queue it's staging right you have backup so makes more sense yes. so there's one more reason okay cross dc writes will be slow right and on kafka basically there is a ttl like in mongodb right so wh what you are doing is uh, as you do slow writes your events will for sure come faster than you are writing right so you will develop a lag irrespective of how many number of partitions you have so after some point of time say 7 days or 8 days you will start losing messages so that's probably not a uh, this thing it's better to copy kafka kafka and then write from there Any other question? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>